<laughs> so, <laughs> who are you? I'm Matt Noguchi. And I'm, look at me, and forget the cameras here and all that fun stuff. Matt Noguchi. Just, I'm the uh, tools and sound programmer for Bungie. And Bungie. For Bungie. At uh, and we're, this doesn't look like a Microsoft office, does it? <laughs> no, this is uh, the new building that Microsoft bought for us after we shipped Halo 2. Ah, so you ship a successful game and they buy you a building and, <laughs> ship a and make you work game. in the... <laughs> yeah, be a successful game studio. Yeah. You get a building. Very it's pretty cool. cool. Wow. So uh, are we going upstairs? or I, we're, we're, What are we doing today? Uh, this I'll is my first time here. So thank, thank you thank you very much for um, interview, inviting me over to see the building. Because you guys just moved in, right? Yeah, we finished moving in about two weeks ago. Okay. And we're finally getting settled. So uh, let's give you the bird's eye view. And obviously we can't see too much around because uh, yeah. I hear you guys are working on some cool stuff. Yeah, but... It's all top secret, can't really talk about it. Why, why is Bungie so secretive? Because Bungie is, uh, and it's not just Bungie, it's the video game industry seems to be very, very secretive about what they're working on. Well, I know for, for us at least, um, we're pretty secretive because what we're doing, we like to, we don't like to just trick a lot of information, we just like to say, hey, this is what we're working on, it's going to be this thing, it's going to be fucking huge, things like that. Yeah. Um, in general, I think a lot of, we try to, the entertainment industry in general is just kind of secretive of what they're working on. Right. Um, you know, that's just the way it is. Okay. Um, and I, tell me, uh, you worked at, what did you do before you came to Bungie? I was a developer in Visual Studio. For Let me see if I can move around this way because the lighting is a little bit better. Okay. Ah, much better. Okay. I was a developer in Visual Studio for about six months, and uh, they didn't really have me doing anything over there. Okay. And I'd always wanted to be in the game industry. And so one day I'm looking at the career website, looking at all the various job postings in, in games, and I see this one posting for a tools programmer at Bungie. Needs to know Windows programming, and that's about it. Yeah. And so I said, hey, okay, hey, can I apply for this job? Okay. Go over, do the interview, do the programming test. About a week later, I get the job offer. Yeah. Did, now, do they have the same uh, one day long gauntlet of interviews that the, the Visual Studio team has? Uh, it's actually our interview process is a bit more involved. Um, usually, we before we actually allow anyone to interview, we send them a programming test to sort, as sort of the minimum barrier to entry. And then, if you do well enough on that, you know, we bring you in for a full day of interviews. Right. How, how is it different? You guys obviously have a um, much different work atmosphere here than the Visual Studio team. How, tell me a little bit about how how different it is to develop a video game than it is to develop a, you know a C, a C sharp app or a, or a Visual Studio or something like that. So the thing about video games that I've I've learned over the past five years is they're just really really hard to make because you you don't only have to worry about you know creating a graphics engine or creating a video game engine and all that crap. You also have to worry about getting you know, creating content, getting that content into the game, getting that content onto a disc, shipping a disc, making sure your builds, your game doesn't crash, making sure your game can run efficiently, and basically, it's it's a much bigger scope in terms of what you can actually what you actually have to think about. Yeah. And you, and yeah, I mean, just making games is hard. Yeah. And we're here at eight in the morning. That's why it's a little quiet in here. Yeah. Because I'm sure around ten or eleven, this thing will. Yeah. People start will... rolling in around nine or ten o'clock. Yeah. Um, tell me, how does a game get started? You know, so were you on the Halo team, or what? What team were you working on? I I started with the Halo team. Okay. And so I've been working with that particular group of people since I started at Bungie. Um, I'm really not sure how this whole process starts, at least at Bungie, because I've worked on you know Halo and Halo Two. Yeah. And both of those games were pretty well. Th the idea for them was pretty well thought out by the time we started working on them. Yeah. I know some game developers who work at other companies, mm -hmm. and the process of vi developing a video game includes a lot more artists and a lot more creative types than, let's say, developing Excel, right? Yeah, uh, in, our, in fact, uh, our development team is about 10 people, and we're, kind of, we're pretty dwarfed by pretty much everyone else that's working on the game, so we have about... So let's see, we have about five or six SDETs. Um, who is it over here? Who is it in this area? Okay. And they're the, the backbone of what we do. Yeah. Uh, they make sure that, you know, build systems are running, that our machines are working, the network's up and running, that any problems we have, you know, deploying 
builds to you know 50, 50 to 100 people, make, make sure all that works. And then we have artists who are all in this area. Okay. In sort of the back row. And there are about 30 or 40 of them. And so, yeah, uh, it's a lot more creative talent than actual programming talent, at least for Bungie. Yeah. How, how does that change the developer's life? Yeah. Uh, you get a lot more immediate feedback about what kind of work you put into the game. Okay. So let's say you put in a new feature and it happens to crash the game. Instead of, you know, it just crashing on your machine, you have, depending on when it gets checked in, let's say you check it into the build and all of a sudden you realize, oh shit, it's going to crash. You suddenly have 30 people crashing and they're all blocked. Yeah. And so you learn, the, the better developers <laughs> learn to make sure their stuff doesn't crash. Yeah. It's a lot like dog fooding your own, it's a lot like dog fooding. Yeah. Uh, but the feedback is much more immediate because usually the guy's about two seats down and says, Hey, Matt, you broke the bill. Yeah. Tell me a little bit about working in this kind of atmosphere where you have – this is a different kind of work atmosphere than I've seen at other, even at, at other companies where you have like – is it a hexagon kind of shape? So the you hexagon have... part's new. Um, but in all the buildings we've been in since we started at Microsoft, um, we've tried to make it as – open an atmosphere as possible with very few offices. Um, it tends to be a bit noisy and it can be distracting, but a lot of times what happens is you have various people just discussing random as aspects of the game and they get this big discussion going just by people you know, listening and saying, oh, hey, I'm interested in that, or hey, I fixed that in this build, or hey, that's kind of stupid, don't do that. Yeah. Would you recommend uh, other parts of Microsoft learn this style of working? Um, you know, I honestly don't know. I think it works for us because we have so much, so much, so many dependencies between all our groups that it helps just being able to get up and walk over. I mean, this is actually our, in our old building. Um, we used to have four segmented rooms, and then after about a year, we just we told the landlord, "Hey, we want to break down the walls and just sort of turn it into a space similar to this, but a bit a bit more se segregated." Um, but yeah, I think. It works well for us because we just ha we just need this collective environment. Yeah. What kind of coding skills do you need to work to build a video game that you know? Because that <laughs> most of the viewers who, on Channel Nine are probably building business apps, mm -hmm. you know, or building little web apps, or building, you know, maybe on the office team. <laughs> you, know, I, not, you know, I mean, most of the people outside who watch this are. You know, working at companies, you know, at I don't know, Chevron, mm -hmm. building business applications. How how is the skills needed to build a video game different than the the guy who builds a Visual Basic .NET app? You know? Well, first and foremost, um, because we're because of how we build games, uh, yeah. we we want to give the artists and designers basically put them in the game and allow them to create the game inside the game. And so, basically, any code that runs. Has to has to be correct to begin with. It can't break. Okay. And so we, we make sure that everyone's running the same code. You know, they're actually running the game when they're editing, the, creating levels, editing art, things like that. Yeah. Um, it also has to be fast, ideally, because otherwise you're going to have frame rate hit. And no one likes a game with a uh, shitty frame rate. And you also that's a technical term, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> stop motion yeah. um, and it, for us um, you have to you have to be very error tolerant because a lot because we're operating in a limited memory environment a lot of times um, usually people it, writing PC apps they can say oh I just need to allocate some memory here you know do, do a little bit of work and free it later but a lot of times for for games like Halo and Halo 2 you can't really do that. You can't say, oh, I just need to allocate some memory because a lot of times we don't have that memory to free. Yeah. So you need to be very rigorous about how you treat memory. Okay. And, you, and for us, at least, we'd like to be able to start from you know, the top level of the game and say, all right, where, what's every single piece of memory being used where's, and how's that data being used and actually being able to trace through everything and understand, you know, okay, so we have you know, one meg allocated for... The, all the various things that can explode in the world, things like that, right. or you know, 50k for sounds, 150k for the music, stuff like that. Okay. Um. What else do I want to know? Uh, 
I have a feeling you have an Xbox 360 somewhere in this building. <laughs> uh, yeah, we have a few. Yeah. How do you like working on it? I'm actually enjoying it a lot. Um, how much do you know about the Xbox 360? Oh, a little bit. We got an interview last week with the Xbox team. So. Okay, so so one of the... We know it has three processors. That, you know, <laughs> we know the basics, so... <laughs> so it's kind of interesting um, because for a long time we've ha we only had to... So for the past five years or so, we've only had to develop games for a single platform. You know, with Xbox and PC have the same underlying architecture, although the, I like the Xbox better just because it's a bit leaner and you can do a lot more crazy stuff. Um, but the big difference, well, there are two main differences. A big difference for us is the Endian order. So, you know, Intel machines are are little Endian so that... Tell me, what does that mean? Endian? It means, uh, so, the, actually, if I had a whiteboard, I could draw this out. Yeah, All right. Should I come over there? No, I can read this over there. Okay, great. All right. So <laughs> Excellent. I like so the rolling whiteboards. I need one of those. <laughs> so the white ordering um, is basically how how data is laid out in memory. Okay. So let's say you have these four bytes of memory, 0, 1, 0, 2, 0, 3, 0, 4. Yep. So on the Intel machine, let's say you had a void pointer to this, this part. So you had void, void, star, p. Okay. So if you had car, p would equal a 1. <laughs> God, it's been so long since I wrote code on the whiteboard. Short. P would equal a one a two. Yeah, that's right. Actually, it would, it would equal a two a one, and then long P would equal a four a three a two a one. And what does this do? So this is just how how the how a long shortened char are laid out in memory Okay. when you write it to you know, a memory address. So this is all little Indian. I could have this backwards, so if anyone complains, tell them that I haven't had much sleep. <laughs> so with big Indian, which is the byte ordering on the, the chips we're using for Xbox 360, you actually have, so char looks the same. Char P would equal you know, 1, but short would look like this. P would actually equal a one a two, and long P would equal a one a two a three a four. Okay. And so this this difference in ordering, yep, um, actually turns out to be a significant issue you need to deal with if you're going to create content on the PC and run it on the Xbox 360. Got it. And so we've actually had had code that dealt with this um, with Halo because it was originally it was originally it was originally intended to be cross-platform between Mac and PC. Yep. Uh, but for the past five years, because we didn't actually have to run on a Mac, uh, we never actually tested any of this. Yeah. Or never actually had to run any of this. And so actually getting this back up and running was an interesting experience. And the Xbox 360 uses um, an IBM chip architecture, which is similar to the Mac, right? Yeah, IBM, I, I have no idea what it's called. Yeah, the uh, PowerPC yeah. chips. So, so what does Xbox 360 let you as a developer do that other game systems don't let you do? That's an interesting question. Uh, we're still getting up and running um, on the new dev kits. Uh, one of the, the cool things, just in general, is things we can do with a console that we normally can't do on a PC. Um, we we are very, because we are very hardcore about how we deal with memory and how we read things off disk, we can actually just tell the, we can just, we can tell, you know, the operating, not the operating system, the graphics hardware, hey, look, we've created all these nice graphics objects for you, all these vertex buffers, textures, everything. Here, just start, we just start throwing it at the graphics hardware. We don't have to worry about telling, you know, calling into an API saying, hey, create us a bunch of graphics objects that we'll fill in later. We just read it into memory, just start spitting it out. Yeah. And 
what's the performance? What I'm trying to get at is what what are we going to see in terms of game qualities that you can't do on the old Xbox or can't do on the PC? Well, for one thing, we have about eight times as much memory. Okay. Um, so that means we can we can uh, actually run at much higher resolutions, ideally. Yeah. Twelve eighty, uh, somewhere around you know twelve eighty by seven twenty. Don't quote me on that. Yeah. Well, we're shooting in HDF here, right? Yeah. <laughs> so. um, in general, the the process we have uh, we have much better floating point performance, I think. Yeah. But at the same time, we have uh, much different architecture. So risk is um, the architecture is in order execution, which is something that we're not used to. With Intel's uh, x86, they have out of order execution, which means you can just throw a bunch of instructions at it. Eventually, they'll come back and say, "All right, here's all the results." And that that turns out to be pretty forgiving for a lot of interesting coding patterns. Yeah. Um, PowerPC is completely the opposite of that. You basically say, "Here's an instruction that says, okay, I'll execute that. Give me more. I'll execute that. Give me more." It doesn't really like batching up, you know, these long chains of code and trying to execute it all at once. It tries to execute everything in order. So everything we learned, every coding practice we've learned on x86 kind of doesn't apply and can actually lead to worse code performance on a PowerPC chip. Okay. Um, one, of my, one of my friends in another video game company told me that company still hasn't found the edges. It hasn't been able to, you know, I, on most video game platforms up to now, mm -hmm. you can see there's ed edges to the performance. You know, in the old uh, flight simulator, for instance, um, you could only see so many miles in in, it, in the distance, and now you know you can see unlimited mm -hmm. visibility. Um, have you found the edges yet of the new game platforms? I think that's a very good question. I don't think we've actually tried to push the limits yet. Okay. Um, most of the time. I honestly can't say yet. It's definitely a, a much more powerful platform than the Xbox, and so we're ju we're just getting used to all that extra power. Very cool. What else would you like people to know about developing video games? Or just that developing games is really hard, yeah. and it's really easy for for various for you know game critics, websites, journalists to say, oh well. This game is bad because of this one feature X, and if they hadn't worked on that one feature X, they could have spent all this time on all the other aspects of the game. But a lot of times, with at least in my experience, with Halo and Halo 2, you can't really say this one feature had such deleterious effect on the entire game. It's usually the fact of making the game had a deleterious effect on the actual game. Yeah. So for Halo 2, I mean, we had, we've had various problems at ship. Uh, technical being the technical, the biggest technical problem being, um, you know, cinematic during cinematics. There's pop in. What, what is cinematics? Uh, these are the the non-interactive cutscenes where you see the Master Chief doing something cool that you normally can't do in game. Got it. Like uh, jumping out of a spaceship, space station, and flying a bomb into a ship, and then kicking off and flying down to Earth and landing on a ship. Um, so there's a lot of pop in during the cinematics, and, and some people attribute that to, oh, they tried to... What's pop-in? Pop-in is basically you're looking at the scene, and the quality of the characters changes during okay. the scene, and pretty erratically, and pretty, pretty abruptly. And so you say, oh, you have this, you know, low-res texture, and all of a sudden it pops into high quality, and you're wondering, what the hell just happened there? Yeah. And so... You hear a lot of people theor having theories about why that happens. You know, oh, they were trying to do too much. They were... They added normal mapping to the game, and so that slowed down the cutscenes and caused pop-in. When really, it was the fact that we we're trying to make Halo 2, and we had this extremely epic scale that we were trying to accomplish. I mean, yeah. that more that approach we took more than anything else caused pop-in. And then yeah, let's go over here so we can. And a then bit it was sort of an interaction with that idea, that that scope, and how it actually ended up in game that caused the pop-in. Plus, yeah. with all the other things we we're trying to do, like prevent load times as you're playing the game. Right. Um, things like that. Um, so it, it's I, it's really easy to take something you don't understand, take one tiny aspect of it that you do understand, and use that to generalize the behavior and attributes of the entire game. Yeah. But that's something that you <laughs> she's falling. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> that's something you just really shouldn't do because making games is hard. Yeah. And it's really easy to say, you know, this one little thing about it ruined the entire game, but that's never the case. Yeah. It's just the game ruined the game because they had to ship something. Yeah. Tell me a little bit about working with uh, multiplayer. It, uh, you know, Xbox Live seems to be really going to be a hit. Uh, and Gadget just rated... Um, uh, everybody's rolling around. Let's see if we can go upstairs or something like oh, that. Sure. All right. Get away from you. Well, it's harder to hear. Yeah. <clears throat> so, um, yeah, it's a little bit quieter over here. Xbox uh, Live, mm -hmm. you know, the live service, so I can be playing with 8 or 16, 16 people or 8 people. It depends it, on the game. Yeah, and um, how how is multiplayer in the live service changing how you guys have to do your work? Um, I didn't really work on Xbox Live that much, okay. so I can't really give too much uh, in-depth, any, any deep understanding of that. Right. Um, but... I do know that it gave us the it basically gave us the opportunity to create a multiplayer game without having to worry about how people are going to connect. Yeah. And it basically said gave us this giant service that said, "Hey, here are a bunch of people that are going to be playing at the same time. We'll let you, you know, advertise your game, and you can pick who you're going to play with, and then the rest of it's up to you." Yeah. Tell me a little bit about the tools you use to develop code. I mean, do you just use Visual Studio, or do you have custom tools that... Have so, for, for writing code, I use Visual Studio, and I also use um, Visual Assist, which is a plugin okay. that does crazy things like extra syntax hi highlighting and extra features that allow you to navigate through source code better. Okay. Um, for... But the other tools I use, uh, we have two other... three other tools. We have um, a command line tool we call Tool, that is just sort of the, the generic data processing command line tool that everyone, that all the other programmers write code that plugs into that to make to do things like convert raw pixel data into textures we can use in game or to take models and optimize them and get them into game, things like that. And then we have a game data editor called Gorilla that's sort of your one stop, it's kind of like Visual Studio for the game. Um, it allows you to look at pretty much any data that you can modify in game, tweak it, update it, save it, check it out, check it in source control, um, send it over to whatever target platform you're using, things like that. Okay. And the la the last tool, which I was hired to actually create, is Sapien, and that's our level creation tool. And this is the tool that runs the game, allows you to populate it with characters, vehicles, crates, boulders, rocks, scenery, things like that, allow you to set up the various game encounters allow you to tweak the AI, things like that. Okay. And that's the thing that usually crashes more often than anything else because it, it's running the game and so it's, it's pulling it on all the latest bits and running the, the latest code. Very cool. What are you proudest of? What I'm most proud of? Um, I'd have to go with Sapien because I've worked on that for about four years now, or five years actually. And uh, we just hired, we recently hired a new tools programmer, and he started to take over a lot of the, started to take over the code base, and being able to, yeah, have, being able to write a, an app all by yourself, and then have someone else maintain it, and not come to you and complain about how shitty the code is, yeah. is probably one of the, yeah, one of the more proud things I've done. Cool. When I was telling people I was coming here, you know, especially the MVPs, they uh -huh. were like, oh, man, you are so lucky. <laughs> Is it really as glamorous as it seems from the outside to work in, uh, at Bungie? I'd have to say yes. <laughs> I mean, you, you have pretty much one of the best groups of people in the industry all working together and working, you know, towards this depending on how many things we're working on. But, I mean, you have just a bunch of creative, intelligent people working together. And, yeah, just ha that... I'm going to sound a little... a little... Uh, <laughs> preachy here. But just having that raw amount of creative energy in a single room and being able to harness that and direct it and create stuff out of that, it's just such an awesome feeling. Yeah. I mean, it makes... 
everything about this job worthwhile. I mean, even staying late, you know, doing 20, 24 hour work days, you know, for weeks on end, things like that. Things that would normally just make you say, this isn't worth it. All what eventually comes out and what you see people do makes it all worth it, yeah. at least for me. What, what's it like shipping a product and having people wait, you know, an hour? I waited in Silicon Valley with uh, 300 people in line to pick up Halo 2. What's it like to watch that happen around the world as a developer? So honestly, um, I had, so for Halo 1, I had no, we had no idea how popular it would be. Well, I mean, I'm sure some people in the, the group did, but I I thought, wow, we, we, we made this incredibly awesome game, but how are people going to play the most awesome parts? The most awesome part being multiplayer. Just wondering, well, we've had so much fun with this, but how are, how is everyone else going to have fun with this? And it turned out that people, you know, just came up with ways to play multiplayer. It wasn't, they actually went out of their way to have LAN parties, to bring all their Xboxes together, to have these huge events, and we're like, okay. And to, to see how, how far Halo and Halo has penetrated into, you know, the entertainment industry, into the media, it's pretty impressive. Um, I think it's cool. I don't really feel proud or disappointed by it because I didn't work on a lot of what people like about Halo 2. I just worked on sort of the, the ground layer, just making sure we could actually kick it out the door. Yeah. Um, but for Halo 2, Halo shipping Halo 2 was a lot of fun after we actually stamped the disc and stopped worrying about it. Uh, the fan fest we had was pretty was pretty amazing. You know, What's a fan fest? Oh, so fan, we Bungie in the past has had uh, Bungie Fan Fest where we basically go to a convention center, usually around the same time as a really big industry event like E3 or Macworld in the past. Yep. <laughs> and uh, basically say, hey, Bungie fans, we're going to be here. Come and meet Bungie people. And so for Halo 2, we rented out the EMP and just had this one huge event right in the middle of that. And so just to see how many people were standing out in line, people skipping school, you know, kids bringing their parents in just to make sure they could get in through the door. Yep. That was a lot of fun. And then to, later that night, we went around and visited a bunch of stores where people were lined up for who knows how long. Oh, yeah. yeah. I, well, I was in Silicon Valley, and I, we were actually uh, texting with people in line all over the world <laughs> and watching their blogs and stuff. And it was really amazing. It's going to be interesting to see from what I'm hearing, it's really hard to get an Xbox 360 right now. You know, yeah. friends of mine <laughs> from around the world are going, "Do you know anybody who has a, who, who I can get on the, li the list?" So it looks like you guys. It looks like we have another hit on our hands. Um, what are we going to see from Bungie for Xbox? Are you allowed to talk to us about that? Not allowed to talk about that. Okay, but it'll be cool, I would assume. <laughs> it'll be a Bungie product. <laughs> Well, thank you very much. Is there anything else uh, we should know about working at Bungie? Or, I mean, it's our first little trip here. And, well, uh, why don't we take a bird's eye look? Okay. I don't think you can see anything from up there that would be dangerous. Well, we uh, got our new HD camera here, so we'll try. <laughs> yeah, this is our upstairs area. That's nice. Yeah, from here you can uh, see pretty much everything. Yeah. So, uh, the artists work over here? Yeah, so so this row, this column of desks is programmers, and then everyone to the right of that is artists. Okay. And I can see some art on the screens over there. So. Yeah. Um, what else do I want to know as a, Disc away. As a game programmer? What would I want to know about? I've run through most of my stuff. T anything about the last five years stick out in your mind of, you know, times where you guys hit a big challenge or found something? Well, I don't know. Tell me, tell me about what sticks out in your mind about the <laughs> triumphs or uh, lows, lows or highs of the last five years. Well, let's see. Um, the best. Work, the be one of the better work days we had was uh, actually kind of a horrible one where we, we basically said, all right, by 6 a.m. this Saturday, you can't check in at any, you can't add, we can't add any new features. 
And so the day before we get to work and we just start plowing through features, plowing through features, plowing through features, plowing through features. About a half hour before the six six o'clock six a.m. cutoff time, um, there's this one feature that that I've been thinking about that I just have to get in for the sound engine. It's the uh, it was the the vacuum atmospheric effect that sort of dampens down all the noise that happens when you're in space station. You know, you're going outside. Anyway, point being, you now half hour to get this stuff checked in, start start banging out the code. All right, how am I going to do this? How am I going to do this? Okay, I know how to do this. All right, compile. All right, I need a code review. All right, check it in. Oh shit, I forgot to add something. All right, come over again. I got a code review. All right, check it in. All right, six o'clock. Yes, time to go home and sleep. And of course, I came back about six hours later and learned that the feature I just added caused all the sound to stop working. So. <laughs> what is it about the video game industry that causes geeks and developers to spend such out long hours? You know, I think it's for me because I've heard that from other my friends who work in the video game industry. One of my friends works at another company, mm -hmm. and he literally camps out. You know, once in a while, he does music for a, a game company, mm -hmm. and he literally takes a sleeping bag and just camps out there while the team is working on on these features. What is it about the? Because I don't see that in most other software companies. You know. Well, I, th I think it depends. I mean, you have I mean, there are some some. You know, I've seen the Windows team spend some time yeah, yeah. like that, but uh, um, the bad crunches happen with poor management. Poor management just dictates. All right, we need to. The only way we can measure your the effort you're doing is by how how many hours you work. So now we're going to increase your output by making you work 90 hours a week or 100 hours a week. So those are the bad crunches because they don't really serve any purpose other than to measure how many hours you're working. But the crunches that that I tend to enjoy <laughs> afterwards um, are the ones where we're just we're just. I think what drives us and what keeps us at work so much is when we're creating something new or polishing something or just taking a body of work and just making sure that we can actually kick it out the door when we finally stamp the disc. I think that is what drives a lot of us more than anything else. The fact that we're creating something pretty much out of nothing and it's not actually going to become anything physical, but it allows us, I don't know, this is going to sound kind of... Uh, philosophical, but it allows us to, to create experiences for other people. And so for me, um, it's all about you know making sure that everyone else has that code base that they can work with that doesn't crash, that allows them to create whatever they have in their mind, whatever they want to put in the game with as little hassle and little overhead as possible. Yeah. I don't think I asked you your name at the beginning. Oh, I'm M Matt Noguchi. Matt Noguchi. Okay. Thank you very much, and this is a real treat for us, and I think for the viewers getting a little bit of a behind the scene of how how Halo and other games, because you're not just working on Halo, are you? Can't talk about that. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, thank you very much, and we're looking forward to seeing your work soon at a store. So. Yeah, me too. Thanks, man. No problem. Okay.